So Sushma is the moderator here, but till she is logging in, uh, Swati is connected for the next session. Yeah, welcome Swati. Hi, sir. Hi. So Satyan sir is there, Rajul is there, Shilpa is there. They will moderate till the... Sir, uh, it yeah. has been enabled. You can... Yeah. So from my first talk, I have two talks. I'll present both talks uh, one after another. My first talk is on combined surgery. That is cataract plus trabeculectomy. So, uh, my slide is visible and I'm audible also? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So, uh, there are no financial disclosures to disclose. We all know that cataract and glaucoma is a leading cause of blindness worldwide and is the most common ocular condition associated with the aging process. So, prevalence is increasing due to increase the lifespan of our population, and this also increases of nucleus sclerotic cataract with elevated IOP and glaucoma medication, which we have to understand and keep in mind when treating this combined disease. So, there are uh, three surgical approaches to treat this uh, combined disease. You have cataract extraction alone with dial implantation. Then you have a sequential surgery where you do a trabeculotomy first, followed by cataract and I will later on. That is a two-stage procedure. And then you have a combined cataract and glaucoma surgery. So my talk is going to be on a combined surgery. That is a triple procedure. That is cataract extraction plus trabeculotomy. So what are the indications for this combined surgery? There should be a cataract with glaucoma patients who are having failure to achieve target pressures by medications. There are issues related to compliance, adherence, and drug-induced side effects. This is borderline controlled IOP, disease progression, or advanced glaucoma is optic atrophy despite maximum medical therapy. And when you have an uncontrolled glaucoma, but an urgent need to restore vision or when two separate operations are not feasible. So what are the advantages of combined procedure? It eliminates the need for two separate surgeries. The early post-operative IOP rise is significantly less in this procedure. There is a significant improvement in visual acuity and IOP. Visual acuity basically due to the cataract surgery and not due to glaucoma surgery. And IOP due to the glaucoma surgery. Decrease in the number of glaucoma medications also. So when we look at the surgical concentration, especially the preoperative concentration, we should first analyze what is the cause of significant visual loss. Is it due to cataract alone or due to cataract and glaucoma? And if so, what was the how much is the loss due to cataract? Because whenever you say you are going to do a cataract surgery, patient expectation is six by six. Patient always thinks that once the cataract surgery is done, my vision will be very good. So you have to give a logical explanation to the patient that what vision is lost due to cataract, you regain back after the surgery. But whatever is lost due to glaucoma, you will never regain back. The glaucoma surgery is being done so that to preserve the vision what is left. Also do a careful sit lamp examination because most of these patients might have pseudo exploration, shallow entry chamber, there might be a myotic pupil. You do a clear fundus examination to see whether there is a glaucoma to optic atrophy alone or there is any associated micro pathology also. In property concentrations, uh, quite a few often we have this irreversible meiosis. So when you're doing the phaco trabeculectomy, you should always look uh, keep in uh, keep in mind pupil expansion devices like the rings, hooks, and expanders to manage this small irreversible myopic pupil. When you're doing an SICS, you can consider of stretch pupiloplasty, microcentrotomy, or sector addictomy. Viscular substance, sodium hydrate is a viscular acid substance of choice. It maintains plaque entry chamber and deep and AC, and it can be washed out in one go. I aim for adequate exercise, which is 5 to 6 millimeters. IOL selection can be PMA, acrylic, or silicon IOLs. But in case when there is no capsule server, make sure that ECR is avoided. You can implant SFIL or Nyris Lorenz, but ECR is a big no. A combined technique surgery, there are different techniques. There are two single side technique and the twin side technique. Single side technique, you can do SICS or PICO for cataract surgery plus a trabeculectomy, and both these surgeries are done to the same side. It involves less surgical time. But with the twin side technique, you have to do only FACO trap. SICS trap, the large amount of dissection, so better to do a FACO trap. When FACO is done to a separate clear coordinate temporal incision, as for first step, followed by trabeculotomy at the superior lumbus. It involves slightly more surgical time, but results are comparable. I'm just showing, demonstrating simultaneously the video of both the surgeries. So first you need to take, uh, either you can take a coronal stage suture of 8 vital or a superior rectus 4 0 stage suture. Mark your congenital flap. When you're doing the SIC strap, I usually mark it at 6 to 6.5 millimeter on the congenital. And when I'm doing the paper trap, I mark it at 3.5 millimeter. So once you mark the congenital flap, uh, uh, congenital, make a congenital flap, do subcongenital direction as much posterior as possible so as to have a posterior diffuse blood. Identify the bleeders and cauterize only the bleeders. Don't over cauterize it because if you over cauterize it, there will be shrinkage of the skeletal flap after you create it. Once the cauterize is done, if you want to inject any antimate overlight, uh, you can either inject the antimate overlight subcranial injection as much away posteriorly as possible superiorly before the start of the surgery, or you can use the response to use antimate overlight. Thoroughly wash the antimate overlight and then again mark the scleral flap as I told 6.5 for SIC step, 3.5 for 
take out line. Mark the scalar line and then make a triangular incision with the help of the number plate. Then lift the apex of the triangular flap. You can see that I'm making the flap. I'm lifting the apex of the triangular flap superiorly, and I'm just touching the edge of the 15 number cutting. Uh, the cutting edge of the 15 number blade at the junction. And you can see the moment you touch, it gets separated. So this is the way you're going to do. You are just going to lift the flap superiorly and just touch the cutting edge of the blade, and you get a nice uniform spherical flap. So uh, same thing you can see in the paper tab also I'm doing. So once the flap is created, then the procedure is same. What you are doing, you're looking at the so for the SHA step. Now the SHA step start. You have made the spiral flap. Now you made the tunnel. You made the two lateral ones, and then do the normal SHA. It is in paper trap. From superior, you have to shift to temporarily. You saw I shifted temporarily. I made the two side ports. I made the main coil incision. Now you have to be prepared. As I told you, this pupil was small, so I pre-planned that I'm going to use a malleable ring. Uh, to work on this uh, myotic pupil. So I'm injecting the my uh, the myelin ring and I'm uh, going to dilate the pupil with the help of this expansion device. And whenever you're doing uh, cataract surgery, especially paper trap, uh, what I prefer is uh, slow motion paper emulsification. I don't want too much of turbulence into the anterior chamber because that can lead to pigment dispersion and that can lead to clogging of the angles. So what I do is I use a slow motion paper emulsification, but at the same time you have to remember that just because you are using a slow motion paper emulsification doesn't mean that you will increase the surgical time. You have to wisely use, use the surgical time. The surgical time should be as less as possible. So all the other steps are in really same, whether you do an SICA trap or whether you do a FACO trap. So FACO trap, I do a stop and chop technique, which is the preferred technique of my choice. I make a central trench, separate the two hemispheres and then each hemisphere is subdivided into three or four small pieces and then uh, all the small pieces are emulsified and then the IOL is injected. Now you can see the SIC step after I injected the IOL, I'm making the internal ostium with the help of 11 number blade, it's 251 millimeter internal ostium. First you put fine scratches on the tissue which you're going to cut, then you make deep cuts and then cut out this rectangular flap and then a broad based peripheral iridotomy is done with the help of the Vana scissor. Once this is done, I, I initially I used to put uh, one intermittent apical suture and two releasable suture for SICA strap. Now what I do is I put uh, one releasable apical suture, that's it, uh, whether it is SICA strap or a FICO trap. So basically uh, the technique of releasable suture is very, very important. You can see in the FICO trap also, I'm making the internal ostium with the help of the 11 number blade. So technique of releasable suture, as I was discussing, is first pass a 10 0 epicon suture into the clear cornea parallel to the limbus, then from the clear cornea perpendicular to the limbus into the scleral flap, and then from the scleral flap into the index theta. Now you can see a loop is created over the scleral flap. Now take four throws and pass these throws over this loop so that the shoe is not as tight. Advantages of releasable suture are you can have a tight suture so, uh, so that the AC is formed, there's no much of leakage, and then you can post operatively tight it. Uh, how much you want the digital switches to be released, so if you are to digital switches, you can titrate post how you want to do it. So the digital switches are put on either side. Now, suture in the conjunctival flap also is very, very important. You have to make sure that you take some episodal tissue at the limbus or the limber tissue so that the conjunctiva gets anchored at the limbus. So that at either end, both the conjunctival tissue is anchored at the limbus because by doing that, you won't have any retraction of the blep or the conjunctiva behind. So anchoring of the conjunctiva at the limbus is very, very important. We are going to do this with the 80 vital interlocking sutures. You can see I'm using interlocking sutures and nicely the conjunctiva is anchored at the limbus. Now by doing this, there won't be any retraction of the conjunctiva flap. Then do the stromal hydration and look for the patency of the blood. Once it is done, then you can trim off the residual sutures which are exposed on the cornea. And this is how you are going to do a combined surgery. Now, there can be some variations in the way you make the internal ostium. Now, this is an SICA strap in which a straight tunnel is made uh, a bit more posteriorly. And with the help of a Kelly sponge, I'm doing an internal, I'm creating the internal ostium in an L-shaped manner. So, this is what was talked to me by my mentor, Dr. Sattinson. And L-shaped manner, uh, you do the internal ostium. So, basically, two vertical and one horizontal punch will be sufficient. But sometimes that is not sufficient. You have to move more and then do a broad based peripheral array coming. And then when you're using this straight tunnel also, you can put one intermittent and one releasable suture. You can see in this, I put one intermittent and one liberal suture, and then I'm doing the internal suturing. Another variation is of creating the internal ostium. You can use an MVR at the blue white junction. You pass it into the entry chamber. The MVR slightly extended. And with the help of the Vana scissor, you can cut vertically the two edges of the rectangular flap. Uh, you can see now I'm going to cut this 
the help of one us do it similarly on the other side also the interlocking is created and then a broader spherical annulation can be done so this is what i wanted to speak about uh, combined sizing uh, thank you if any questions i am there to take over so uh, uh shilpa should i go with my next talk or do you want me to continue, uh, take any questions for this uh sir i, I think uh, she has left uh in the, okay i'll go for my next talk also because we are already late for the session okay okay fine and uh, swati is there what about sushma did you contact her she is the moderator uh yeah sir we are, we are on it uh, we are contacting her sir right now okay so i'll go with my next talk the whole session will go late okay okay sir so my next talk is on uh, managing failing blep with raised iop sir uh, someone just said uh, the slides are not moving uh, slides are not moving yeah so in the last now? session now no no sir i don't know that's what is happening with zoom i tried yesterday also to record it from 1 uh, to 2 uh, not moving so it's uh, stuck on one so i think the best would be uh, the slide sir it to slide same show. no no i went that's to slide show the I, slide show see, the slide show when i click my side i am seeing all the slides okay in the slide show but i don't know in the zoom message also are talking to ellen and somebody from the abhinava team also when i did the recording the slide show is not there my whole commentary comes but the slides don't move so i think best would be what i'll do is i won't do the slide show i'll yes, sir. instead of that i'll select like this the slides that will be better yeah 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 that yes will yes be better then yeah so yeah. Uh, i'll start my talk i'm going to present a talk on managing failing blep with raised iop so we all know that trabeculectomy is the surgical treatment of choice for many patients with glaucoma and the overall success rate is reasonably high but a proportion of the procedures fail and why these procedures fail so post trabeculectomy why what do we look for we look for iop whether it is high or normal look at the ac whether it is deep or shallow and look at the blep whether it is flat or encystic so what are the failing or a failed blep basically these are the blep which has increased vascularity that is a cause two vessels is a high iop in the first one it can be an encapsulated high dome appearance of the blep as you can see in this picture you can have a flat localized and absence of microcysts so these are the signs of all failing blep so when you have a raised iop with deep ac uh, you look for intraocular cause it can be due to the internal obstruction by blood fibrinous clot iris or vitreous look for the ocular cause which can be due to fibroblastic proliferation and the extraocular cause can be due to tight spheral suture so when you have an uncontrolled iop and deep ac always do a gonioscopy first look for obstruction to the flow at the sclerosome site obstruction with mild fibrin and minimal blood is transient and does not need any intervention if the interlocking is obstructed with iris or vitreous incarceration a dense fibrinous fibrin consider laser internal revision or surgical intervention if it is a dense fibrinous clot or a blood clot which is opposing the fistula consider tissue plasminogen activity so digital ocular compression it is indicated in the early post operative uh, post operative elevated iop and flat blep it separates edges of the serial blep by expanding the subcontinental space and decreases the iop and elevates the blep it is not effective when the fistula is blocked internally so always make sure that the fistula is first patent and then you can start to digital ocular compression with your signs of failing blep the technique is very important you have to apply slow and steady pressure for about 15 seconds it can be applied with the index finger to the inferior sclera to the lower lid or the sclera posterior adjacent to the blood to the upper lid you can also use a focal compression with the motion cotton tape at the edge of the sclera blood this has to be done by the ophthalmologist whereas with the finger it can be taught to the patient the patient can do by himself also now basically when you do uh, ocular digital ocular massage you have to look for the ac depth the height of the blood and iop which should be noted If successful, then it has to be repeated several times. If the IOP remains high, then removal of the residual suture or laser suture lysis has to be considered as the next step. Now, residual suture, as I told you in my previous talk, also it is uh, allows tight closure of the sclerotic tract. Then uh, the aqueous flow can be increased post-operatively, and the external suture is very easy to do. I'm not going to go into the technique of the residual suture because I already explained in the last talk. Uh, still, I think the video was not visible. Now the video is visible. so i just uh, speak about it you pass the first suture into the clear cornea parallel to the limbus and you can see once this suture is passed 
then you pass perpendicular to the limbus on the clear cornea into the spheral plane. So this is the second step. Now the suture is perpendicular to the limbus, withdraw this needle, and then this needle is passed from the scleral flap into the intact sleeve. So once this is done, you will see that a loop is created on the scleral flap. This is a slow motion video actually. I don't know the uh, bandwidth is not working properly or what. So once you pass the suture, you can see a loop is created on the scleral flap. Yeah, this is a loop. Now take four throws and pass over this loop and tighten it. So four throws are taken in a shoeless manner. This part is tight. So you just put to pass over this loop and pull it. Now releasable suture, release also is very easy. Now how do you release it? You can see it's on the slit lamp, uh, there's an exposed end on the cornea. So this exposed end of the uh, suture, you can just release it with the, this exposed end, you can release it with the help of your twenty-six gauge needle. And then with the help of a tying forcer, just pull it out and slowly you pull it out and see that the blood gets formed. If the blood doesn't get formed, once you release it, you can just do the digital ocular compression and uh, the blood will form. So this is how you're going to do the uh, releasable suture. You can also do urban laser suture analysis. The timing is very critical. It is effective within the first two weeks after surgery without antimetabolite. And with antimetabolites, it will be effective for several months after the surgery. You have to use a conservative stepwise approach. You cut one suture at a time or you could release one suture at a time and when you do the releasable suture. So basically the technique is you use the topical anesthesia, you can use Hoskins or this lens, or you can also use the flat button of the core meter. This lens is flattened and blanched over the inconvenient tower. As I told you, the central button edge of the size of the suspension lens can also be used. And basically you focus on this suture uh, uh, after compressing with this lens and give four or five shots and the laser uh, suture gets cut and then you can start with the film. So you can see that the laser beam is focused on the suture and the suture's laser beam is shot four to five shots and the suture is cut. So this is how you're going to use uh, do the laser suture analysis. Now, rapid wound healing response is one of the major causes of failing blood. So the subconventional fibrosis, the incidence of failure is approximately 20% in the early period, 30 to 50% with the date for shock and rate. Subtrainers and capsulations of blood usually occurs in the first six months after the surgery and usually seen in 10 to 20% of the patients after trophic lift up. So anti-metabolites, you have 5FU and mitomycin C, which inhibits the fibrovarsive proliferation. So mitomycin, you know, or you all know that it's 100 times more potent than 5FU and kills all cycles, regardless of their phase in the cell cycle. You can use subcontinual addition of 0.0 to 0.04 milligram per 0.1 ml initially before the start of the surgery, or even when you can combine it with blood bleeding. You can also use topical drops of 0.02% four times a day for two weeks. For 5FU, it inhibits fibrosis proliferation. One keeps only the dividing cells. You can use subcontinual addition of 5FU, 5 milligram per 0.1 ml. Total dosage will be 15 to 30 milligram over three weeks' time. You should always look for blood features, coronal complications, and only. 5FU is more epithelial toxic and mitomic is more endothelial toxic. Coming to blep needling, it is useful for failing blep, encapsulated hydroplanes, and flat localized blep. The goal is to re establish the fistula from the anterior chamber to a subcontinental space where a fistula can be reabsorbed. So, this is a blep needling. The indication, as I told you, was flat and encapsulated blep. This needling procedure it can be done in the OPD or in the OT. It is a debatable issue. This is a video I am showing in which the blep needling is done in the OPD. Uh, uh, 30 gauge needle is passed 5 millimeter away from the lateral edge of the blood, and then uh, subcontinental dissection is done with the 2 and 4 motion. And once you have cut all the subcontinental tissue until the other end of the blood, and retract, retract the needle and try to invade in the subspheral space, try to cut all this, and then from the subspheral space, you can invade into the internal ostium. So you can see that as I'm doing the needling, uh, the blood is being formed, and you should try to avoid the vessels as much as possible. And the two pictures, which is showing the first encapsulated blood and post needling, how this was a diffuse blood. So, the other video which shows how do you do a blood needling into the operation theater. So, this patient was taken into the OR. Basically, I am taking an 80 corneal stage suture. Once the corneal stage suture is taken, it is much easier because you can just retract the, this is being done in the topic anesthesia. So, you can just retract the group inferiorly and so that you get a more exposed area to do the needling. Now, once the stay suture is taken, you can see a IV vascular flat blood. I'm injecting subconjunctival 0.1 ml of 0 0.02 milligram per ml, uh, 0 0.02 milligram per 0.1 ml of uh, mitomycin as much posteriorly as possible. So once this subcontinental injection is done, I wait for about two to three minutes and then I start my needling procedure. 
so you can see I, uh, in this wait to, uh, two to three minutes holding period i try to iron out or brush up the mitomycin as much possible as possible uh, so that the mitomycin doesn't enter into the entry chamber when i'm doing the needling so try to brush it out or iron out as much as possible uh, as possible after waiting period of two to three minutes and then you start with your needling procedure as i told you with the needling procedure you take 26 gauge needle bend it in the l-shaped form five millimeters away from the uh, basically lateral edge of the blood you invert subcentrally try to go to cut uh, to a promotion cut all the subcentral tissue now you see i've entered into the entry chamber also you can see the tip into the entry chamber and the aqueous is drained out and the blood is being formed there is some hemorrhages because it was a highly vascular uh, blood so some vessels have been uh, traumatized and there is uh, bleeding also which is going on so once this uh, blood is and uh, patency is uh, maintained with the help of this uh, needle then you have to do a stroma create a side port and look for do a stroma hydration so that you look for the patency of the blood so this is how you are going to do basically uh, the blood needling in the opd or in the or this is a photograph which shows uh, the, the same patient which was done in the OR. They were only flat blood. And after the blood only one week follow-up, the multiple cysts were seen. And this is the six-month follow-up for the picture looks like. So uh, blood needling is a very useful procedure. You always look for the change in the appearance of the blood. Soon after the needling, you should start antibody steroid drops. Digital massage has to be instituted and continue for long term. You can accompany the needling with the help of uh, mitomycin or five piece of internal injections. It can be given super temporarily before needling and then massage um, for two to five minutes. Blood with thick scar and quick failure, mitomycin should be used. And while those that succeeded longer and failed slowly may respond to 5FU. So, blood needling is a very important procedure. And uh, we should always try it before going for a retrieve or for a wall surgery. Uh, if at all, uh, uh, you are considering for a repeat surgery. So, key to successful post management is early recognition of this fading blood and correct selection and timing of the various intervention options. So, thank you. Uh, I hope my slides were visible this time, Swati. Sushma is yeah. here. Yes, so yeah. Sushma, <laughs> we started <laughs> the session before you logged in because we were running late already. No, so no, I thought, that's perfectly I fine. I was given the attendees link, so I was I was able to see you guys and listen, but I could not see it, say anything. So, okay. so there was some glitch. The, they sorted out now. Anyway, thanks for the wonderful talk. I was able to listen both the talks, cataract and uh, trabeclectomy as well as blood failures. I think in interest of time, we'll keep the questions to the end, if that is okay. Yeah, so I'm going to, Tushma, I'm going to log out. So go to the okay. uh, okay. So anything, you all are there, all the experts are there. If any questions come on these two topics, you all can always answer. So I would just maybe uh, ask a comment from Dr. Jyoti Shetty, if she's around, for uh, Amit's talk, if possible. She is not logged in. Not logged in. Okay. No. It's, Fine, only, Amit. it's only Swati Upadhyay, Swati R, you and... Me and Shashank. That's it. Okay. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much, Amit. Wonderful listening yeah. to you. Have a great okay. day. Bye. Thanks. So I think Swati, you are ready for your talk now. You're muted. Please unmute yourself. I have already given. Hi, Sushma. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you, sir. Wonderful talk. Okay. And uh, Sushma, I had given my recorded talks to Jyoti yesterday. She received them. So I would yeah. like her to play the talk. Yeah, so Jyoti, can you please uh, play the talks? The yesterday, uh, the video you can play of Dr. Swati Upadhyay on MIGS current concept, the technical sure, team. Sure, sure, sure ma'am, sure. Yeah, thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Swati Upadhyay from Arvindar Hospital, Pondicherry. At the very outset, I would like to thank Karnataka Ophthalmological Society for giving me this opportunity and Dr. Pashupati for making me a part of this instruction course. I'll be speaking on Mix the Current Concepts. I have no financial disclosures. So the gold standard for glaucoma surgery still remains trabeculectomy and we feel very happy and delighted to see such blebs which are minimally vascular diffuse elevated in a quiet eye. Trabeculectomy is advised for advanced to severe glaucomas and it produces 40 to 50% reduction in intraocular pressure over a period of 3 to 5 years. It's an invasive procedure and it's indicated in patients where the benefits outweigh the risk, which may be hypotony, renal cyst, overhanging disfiguring blebs, blebitis, and endophthalmitis. So what about mild to moderate glaucoma where we do not require very low target IOPs? Patients with well-controlled glaucoma but unwilling to use lifelong glaucoma medications, ocular hypertensives, patients with ocular surface disorders, and monoocular patients. 
So here comes minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. The cardinal features are ab internal microincisional approach, minimal trauma to normal anatomy and physiology, demonstrable or reliable IOP lowering and uh, reduction in medication usage, high safety profile, and rapid recovery with a minimal need for follow up. This is the Atma maintenance of, of mix. And presently in India, we have trabectome, eye stent, suture gut, bank, and endocyclophotocoagulation. So the prerequisites for any mixed procedure is then should have a sound knowledge of angle anatomy, good exposure and uh, practice with direct as well as indirect surgical bony lenses, tiltable microscope, MB dexterity and patience. Ideal candidates for any mixed procedure are all patients with open angles, maybe primary open angle, so the exfoliation glaucoma, preventary glaucoma or ocular hypertensions. Relative contraindication can be PACG, but endocyclophotocoagulation is a very effective procedure for PACG patients. Other contraindications are uveitic glaucoma, neovascular glaucoma, malignant glaucoma, congenital anomalies glaucoma, secondary glaucoma. So these are the available options in India. First comes gonioscopy assisted transluminal trabeculotomy developed by Davinder Grover at, in 2014. It creates a 360 degree trabeculotomy. The instruments used for suture data my uh, low temperature cautery, swan so cup gonio prism, 50 proline suture, 15 degrees side port knife, uh, high, uh, high density viscoelastics, cohesive viscoelastics, 25 gauge MBR blade, MST forceps, McPherson forceps, and an indirect gonio lens. So, this is a uh, small video showing the procedure. First, we have to blunt the tip of 50 proline suture using low temperature cautery, then create paracentesis and the main incision. Uh, then fill the visco fill viscoelastic in the AC, then introduce the suture to the side port, then tilt the patient away from you, patient's head away from you, and the microscope towards you. Then under gonioscopic visualization, using 25 gauge MBR blade, we create a limited goniotomy. And then we see the, the white part is the posterior wall of the schlem skinner. Using MST forceps, we introduce the proline suture, then confirm its position in the slam canal. The blue color he helps us to identify the suture position in the slam canal. So as you can see, it has reached halfway. Then keep on pushing in into the anterior chamber, uh, the suture, but gentle thrust when it appears from the opposite side, just grasp it and then pull it outside using McPherson's forceps. Then you can proceed with a normal phaco. In the end, fill the uh, uh, anterior chamber with a little viscoelastic to tamponate all the bleeders or the vessels which are going to which may bleed inside and cause hyphema. There is ample evidence to show that GAT produces a reduction in intraocular pressure as well as in anti glaucoma medications at 1 year, 2 years and also in patients with prior, prior incisional glaucoma surgery. Then we have BANG, which is a low cost alternative to Kahoot dual blade. We, it is made, it is done by using 25 gauge hypodermic needle, which is bent at 90 degrees at the tip. Why we use 25 gauge? Because 26 gauge is too small to reach the nasal angle and 24 gauge is too huge and it can cause psychodialysis. This is a video demonstrating BANG after completing phaco emulsification and intraocular lens implantation. This is we are proceeding with that. We are bending the 25 gauge needle at the tip, making it like a KDB, and then under gonioscopic visualization, through the same incision through which we did FACO, we have to introduce the 25 gauge needle and then identify the uh, trabecular meshwork and then just give clear cuts into the trabecular meshwork, just opening it up. Then turn the blade on the opposite side. And then again, from the initial gonotomy, we have to go for two to three clock hours on the other side. So these bleeders are good enough evidence to show that we have opened the slim skin up. Enough evidence is there also for Kahoot dual blade, not so for bang, but we can use the results of Kahoot dual blade to justify the bang results. So this showing that single use dual blade gonotomy plus phaco emulsification resulted in a significant and sustained reduction in IOP and a decrease in anti medication after six months. Another study by uh, Corman et al. has said that a reduction in IOP is caused by Kahoot dual blade over a, at a period of one year follow. Then comes eye stent trabecular micro bypass or TMB. It is called as uh, eye stent TMB. Uh, US FDA approved in 2012, but in India we have just got import license in 2020. It's the smallest FDA approved device with a snorkel and, uh, and a shaft. So the snorkel is 0.3 millimeters and there is a half open pipe which is around one millimeters. It's made of ferro ferromagnetic retardant coated titanium device and it's safe for patients who are undergoing CT scan or MRI. So this is a video demonstrating 
the uh, eye stent. Another minimally invasive glaucoma surgery in line is the device eye stent. It consists of a snorkel with lumen and a shaft with retention arches and a self-refining tip. During the surgery, the lens is first removed with phaco emulsification and the chamber is filled with origin or halon gene. Under gonioscopic visualization, the eye stent is introduced into the anterior chamber with eye stent probe. Trabecular meshwork is identified and the tip of the eye stent is inserted into the Schlems canal till the whole 1 mm length of the eye stent has entered the Schlems canal and the snorkel is released. A gentle tap is given on the device to push it into the Schlems canal and check the recoil to confirm the position of the eye stent. Tip. Bleed while inserting the eye stent is a confirmatory sign that the tip has entered the Schlems canal. The position of the eye stem is confirmed with indirect gonioscopic lens done intraoperatively and on first postoperative day. So this is the postoperative appearance day one of the eye stem. And there is enough study, uh, studies to say that eye stand works and in conjunction with uh, cathodic extraction, it causes more reduction in intraocular pressure. So at one year, the uh, IOP reduced uh, to less than 21 millimeters of mercury in 72% of the patients and at two years uh, in 61% of the patients as compared to cathodic surgery alone, where it was only 50% reduction. So the most common side effects can be stent obstruction or malposition. So there is one study which shows that there is a 4% IOP reduction from baseline occurring following phaco emulsification as a solo procedure compared to 9% following an eye stent implant with phaco emulsification and a 27% following two eye stent implants with phaco emulsification. So trabectome, as you can see, 1.8 millimeter incision is given and then OVD, invasive viscoelastic and a gonioscopic visualization. We take the trabectin probe, which uses a radio frequency current at 550 kilohertz, and it ablates the intervening trabecular meshwork for up to 180 degrees. Not possible 180 degrees actually, but at least you can have three, uh, four clock hours to five clock hours. So as you can see in this video, this is the trabectin probe. It is introduced into the Schlem scanner, the trabecular meshwork area, then proceeded on one side, just like our A degree, but it has got an advantage that it ablates as well as aspirates at the same time. So it does not leave any debris inside the anterior chamber. Enough evidence to show that trabectome also works and it causes reduction in IOP and anti glaucoma medication. And for patients with preoperative IOP less than 18 millimeters, it was difficult to decrease their IOP more than 20% with trabectome surgery. So, and patients with preoperative IOP more than 26 often required additional glaucoma surgery. So they say that trabectome is not as effective as eye stent or gap. Endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation is a light, it has a light source, endo laser, and a video endoscope in a single 20 hit single probe. So uh, the power settings are 1000 milliwatt, duration of 1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.2 seconds, 3 to 5 laser exposure in each process. So this is a video demonstrating that we have to put OVD behind the iris so that the iris gets elevated and we get a nice and uh, good view uh, entry for the probe. And then under video endoscopic visualization, we can identify the processes and give them laser. It is useful for patients with angle crucial glaucoma. Evidence to show that the combined phaco emulsification ECP in open angle glaucoma versus angle crucial, they say that eyes with CACG were more responsive to phaco ACP in terms of IOP reduction as compared to eyes with primary open angle glaucoma. So, and phaco ACP resulted in greater reduction in IOP and number of medications than phaco emulsification alone in PDOG patients. So the mixed scenario in India at present is a cost of Kahoot dual bill, which is not yet approved in India, is 450 US dollars. As in contrast to KDB, we have bank, one needle just cost 20, 75 INR. Tra uh, Trabectome, yes, 1000 US dollars, that means 52 INR in India, one probe cost, but it is very cost, it is not cost effective. Cost of eye stain, which is approved, but still one eye stain cost around 70,000 INR. Cost of an eye tract catheter is 750 US dollars yet not improved and cost of one proline suture in India is just 10 US dollars. So we, we, we can say that mix is the future. Mix can prevent major complications related to blood forming procedures and yet be efficacious. Suture cut and bank can prove to be low cost alternatives to conventional ab external procedures in the developing countries. And eye stain with FACO can bring a revolution in glaucoma medication management, but we need well-designed studies to prove the efficacy in Indian population. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thanks, uh, Swati. That was an enlightening talk on uh, mids and uh, blood-free surgeries and more 
importantly also showed us that what is the future in India and the cost uh, issues also. Uh, that was very nice. So Thank I think you. Yeah. you would be there right till the session end. Uh, Shishma, my OPD is going on. So okay. okay. So any... I'll just check if there are any questions. There are no yeah. questions from the audience. But uh, yes, I would ask a question that uh, whether have you uh, tried uh, Kahoo Blade, I mean, goniotomies in children? No, 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 not in children. Kahoo Dual Blade is easy, but actually in the children, it's itself uh, difficult to recognize the trabecular meshwork because all the iris processes is there and it's not a normal angle which we see on the gonioscope for the adults. So I haven't tried in KDP in children. Right. But Sunita Dubai Madam has done tra trabectome in children. She has got a lot of trabectome in children. But I have not tried any mix in children as of now. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rati. Good to see you. And thank you for uh, sparing time for this. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank okay. you. I think we can shift to the next talk. That's mine. Can you play, Shashank? Uh, pediatric glaucoma? Sure, ma'am. Sure. Good morning. At the outset, I would like to thank KOS and Dr. Ilan Kumaran for giving me this opportunity to speak here. I'll be talking to you about pediatric glaucoma management. That is the topic assigned to me. Well, when we talk about the pediatric glaucoma management, it includes preoperative evaluation, diagnosis, planning, the surgical consideration, the type of surgery that we perform and the timing, and also the post-operative care and visual rehabilitation. Now, when we evaluate the child in the clinic, it's not an easy task, but believe me, if you can distract the child and allow the comfortable surroundings, a lot of things can be done even in the OPD. If the child is in mother's lap, they may allow you even the slit lamp examination, IOP measurement, and even indirect ophthalmoscopy, and everything for that matter. So we need to evaluate properly in the OPD to at least reach to a, a tentative diagnosis so that when we have to do uh, anesthesia related examination or examination under anesthesia, we uh, can operate at the same sitting. I personally prefer to operate in the same sitting. That means I do a UA and after that surgery, because by the time I uh, uh, schedule the child for an examination under anesthesia, I'm more or less sure of the diagnosis. And then before surgery, you can do all the measurements that are required, say corneal diameter, keratometry, intraocular pressure, uh, slit lamp examination in detail, and uh, IDO if required, and B scan, A scan, UBM, even gonioscopy can be done preoperatively under the microscope. This is the copays lens being used, and you can see the image on the side that you can see through the microscope, so you can understand what are the uh, angle structures. So uh, that is important to do before you operate a patient. Uh, once you've ruled out other causes like uh, endothelial dystrophies or tears in desmets, megalocornea, megalophthalmos, and many more like that, and you're sure of the diagnosis, that is when we decide that how we are going to proceed. So the treatment planning depends on the structural defects, uh, cornea clarity, how the severity of glaucoma is, what is the age of the patient, and uh, systemic issues, etc. Well, uh, the difference largely from the adults when we plan glaucoma management is that medical management has a very, very limited role in uh, children and progression of the disease is quite uh, differently monitored in children because in addition to IOP and this, you also have to look at the corneal diameter, axial length, refraction, etc. Treatment of the existing uh, refractive error and amblyopia therapy are also very, very important for the management. Well, there are different types of surgeries uh, like goniotomy, viscocanalostomy, or mix kind of procedures can be done when the cornea is clear and the angles are open. Trab and trab uh, is the most commonly performed surgery and it can be done in all cases with good prognosis. Uh, when there are lesser chances of trab and trab success, we proceed to glaucoma shunts. And uh, of course, with the poor visual prognosis, we can resort to cyclodestructive procedures. Well, goniotomy is creating an internal cleft in the trabecular meshwork. And uh, the success rate reported is around 60 to 80%. However, with the Kahoo blade, recently the success rates reported are much higher um, for achieving pressure less than 18 millimeters of mercury. So you can see that the, the Kahoo blade, you can actually remove the inner, inner wall of the Schlem's canal. Now, um, in terms of uh, minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, when we talk about all these surgeries are lead-free 
uh, like you can see this um, stent being inserted uh, with the endolite in place with the light at the tip and once it is throughout the uh, you know 360 degree in the Schlem's canal you can remove and that uh, opens up the inner wall of the Schlem's canal so these procedures are blep free but still the, they are yet to outperform the conventional surgery so they are yet not as popular as our uh, conventional surgeries are. This is a conventional trabeculotomy, again has a higher success rate than goniotomy, but more popularly what we do is the combined trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy, where uh, we remove the obstruction to the aqueous outflow and also we bypass the episcleral venous system. So the success rates are much higher as compared to the other procedures, that means 80 to 95 percent almost. So here you can see um, after marking the block, uh, the trabeculotomy being done on either side and following that you can do the routine trabecular meshwork block excision and uh, iridectomy to complete the procedure. Mitomycin C is useful in certain situations in children when there are secondary glaucomas or refractory glaucomas or repeat surgeries and not in a usual case. Uh, coming to tubes or glaucoma shunts, well, uh, when there are failed goniotomies or trabeculotomies or there is more um, conjunctival scarring, or there are syndromic glaucoma associated uveitis, or high risk of choroidal hemorrhage like a phakic pseudophakic glaucoma or vitrectomized eyes, that is when you need uh, to resort to glaucoma shunts. Now, um, primary surgery is also done in selected cases. Uh, what do we do differently in a child with glaucoma shunt uh, is something that we need to understand. So. Many a times we use uh, uh, smaller implants like this. You can see FP8 is what I'm using instead of FP7, which is the adult one, so that the space in the eye is enough to accommodate that. And uh, we anchor the wall around eight millimeter from the uh, limbus. Uh, while tube insertion, what you need to take care is that it should not be too anterior, it should not be too short because there are chances of uh, retraction of the tube uh, in a child due to rubbing etc and as the eyeball grows so you have to be careful on these things of course the tube has to be uh, covered with a, uh, a graft and the conjunctiva closure uh, over that in situations where uh, there is failure failure of drainage implant or their visual prognosis is not great we resort to lasers like diode laser cyclocryo or yag laser now we also have cyclo g6 which is a micro pulse therapy However, we need to understand that risk of physis bulbi does remain in these patients. After surgery, what we have to uh, see in a patient or how do we follow up is again very important. We have to take care of the vision refraction. We need to take uh, care of vision stimulation and amblyopia therapy in addition to measuring the parameters as I discussed earlier like corneal diameter, axial length, etc. Visual fields if the child is big. So in nutshell, the follow-up after first op post-operative day is uh, around three weeks. If you're not able to see all parameters, do an EUA. If uh, IOP is controlled, you can have three monthly follow-up. If the IOP is not controlled, we need to repeat and resort to medical therapy if it is consistently high. Now you may require repeat trap and trap if the pressures are still un uh, not under control or resort to shunt and cyclodestructive procedure. But uh, bottom line is that there is lifelong follow-up, which is important. To end, uh, it's important to have a periodic follow-up and certain parameters need to be uh, assessed in a child. Appropriate counseling of the parents before surgery is very, very important. Selection of a correct surgery at an appropriate time is the key to success. And in addition, we have to uh, consider refractive correction and amblyopia therapy, which are the essential elements in this patient. Thank you for your kind attention. Well, so that was about pediatric glaucoma and one point which, which I could not emphasize much during the talk is that it's very, very important to counsel the parents before you actually take any decision on glaucoma surgery or glaucoma management because they need to understand that the surgery is not the end of the story and it is just the beginning and they have to take care of the follow-up, visual rehabilitation, glasses, amblyopia therapy, which is very, very important to get the optimum outcomes in glau pediatric glaucoma surgery. Well, I'll see if there are any questions. I think there are no questions in the chat box. Uh, do we have Dr. Sirish Nilvigi logged in? That's our net next speaker. Shashank, you have his video. Uh, yes, ma'am. 
so i think he is uh, he is also not logged in right yet yet yeah yeah yes ma'am i can see him yeah so anyway i think uh, as we have to follow the time we will uh, start with the video uh, his video is on uh, glaucoma surgery how and when so uh, please put up uh, that video shashank sure ma'am thank you Hello and a good day to you all. I am Dr. Sirish Nelaviki, Director of Nelaviki Eye Hospital, Bangalore. Uh, I thank the organizing committee and especially the scientific committee of Karnataka Ophthalmic Society for having given me this opportunity to talk today about my lecture, which is uh, glaucoma surgery, when and how. Let me share my uh, presentation to you. The traditional teaching has been uh, that when there is a rapid progression, uh, you need to operate and uh, the surgery is deemed likely to um, happen when uh, the progression happens despite maximally tolerated medical and or laser therapy and risk for continuing to observe outweighs the risk for performing surgery. This has been the traditional way of teaching about when to operate. Now the risk benefit analysis in all these situations has to be considered as far as the medications and the surgery is concerned. When we use the medications, medications could have serious adverse impact, uh, which can be very difficult for the patient. And it is underestimated most of the times, unfortunately. And also probing history is seldom taken from the patient to understand what are the side effects that he's undergoing. Only when he makes a specific complaint about one of the symptoms, do we try to correlate and see if any side effect is happening. Even the patients fail to correlate some of their symptoms with something as innocuous as a eye drop. Episodes of severe hypotension requiring ICU admission are not unheard of with alpha-2 agonists. On the other hand, as far as surgery is concerned, trabeculectomy complications include flat anterior chamber, hypotony, choroidal effusions, blood baths, encapsulation, etc. Complications related more specifically to GDD implantation include tube obstruction, erosion, and motility disturbances, among others. Now, when you do this risk-benefit analysis, you have to understand that medications are non-invasive methods, which is a big advantage. They are more acceptable to most people as the fear of going under the knife is common, and better and better medications are there available now, which make the need for surgery lesser and lesser. On the other hand, you have the surgery, which can result in long-term benefit for the patient without much of a side, side effect of the medications like what we see. And the control of the intraocular pressure is much better and compliance is completely taken care of. Now the question comes, what should I do? Should we operate or should we uh, put medications? When you take, want to take this decision, the factors influencing the decision-making process include the following. I'll go through them one by one. First is the intraocular pressure. Evaluate the IOP and determine progression or likely progression at that IOP, whichever has been set. So higher IOP of more than 30 millimeter mercury, the decision is quite straightforward and you don't have to think too much. You straight away need to go for surgery when you know that you have done your best with the medical line of management. IOP of 20 to 30 millimeter mercury is a dilemma. Here, you have to evaluate for other things among them, most importantly, the progression. Next, you need to evaluate the visual fields. At least six visual fields over two years have to be done to confirm progression as per CNTGS. A clear progression may call for a tilt towards surgery. An apparent progression may call for further field testing for decision-making process. Also, you need to take fundus photographs Serial comparison of disc photographs can be helpful in decision-making process, especially in pre-perimetric glaucoma and elevated intraocular pressure, where the disc photographs can reveal sometimes what you actually don't see with your bare eyes. In advanced diseases, a disc photograph is definitely not helpful at all. Previous ocular surgery has to be kept in mind. If one eye has been operated for glaucoma and then we have a suboptimal outcome or a serious complication in other eye, this may cause hesitation for surgery in the other eye as well. But however, it's not a contraindication, but it is a case where we need to be definitely cautious about it. And so will the patient be. The age of the patient needs to be kept in mind. Have a lower threshold for surgery in younger patients. In fact, if it is a childhood glaucoma, 
I think uh, surgery should be the first thing that we go for. In older patients, we could hold surgery if we feel we can maintain functional vision for lifetime. Family history of glaucoma also counts. The first degree relatives, if they are there, and if there is blindness in first degree relatives, this gives us more impetus for, to do surgery in the patient at hand. Though not an overweighing factor, but we may be more inclined to recommend surgery in a borderline case with blind father and mother. There can be certain special situations like ocular surface disorders. There are higher number of medications, higher the number of medications that we have is higher the case of ocular surface diseases. It may be better to operate than have chronic red, irritated eye with some optimal intraocular pressure, especially in situations like with OST. When there are ocular comorbidities, especially presence of cataract along with glaucoma, and patients with corneal or retinal surgeries with glaucoma, you need to give more predominance to the surgery. Patients with Boston Capro patients, placing GDD later may become actually more difficult and complicated in view of uh, altered conjunctiva and altered anterior segment. Patients with retinal detachment have higher chance of requiring surgery. Patients with poor compliance may be fast tracked for surgery before significant visual loss happens. And uh, doing surgery is definitely more financially viable to patients than long-term medications, especially given the fact that quite a few of the prostaglandin analogs have costs or rates which are 300 or 400 plus. And the monthly cost of uh, treatment medically for the patient turns out to be anything between 500 to 1000, 2500 rupees many a times for such patients. So you have to very, very carefully weigh the balance and see to which side the balance tilts to. Counseling before the surgery especially is very important. Patients do not see better after surgery, sometimes even worse, unless a combined surgery is done. This has to be impressed upon to the patient. And visual recovery to preoperative levels may take a long time, sometimes even up to two years. Post-op discomfort may be higher, like redness, breaking, etc. This has to be explained to the patient. Patients do not appreciate need for surgery as presentation is not dramatic in glaucoma. Complications of surgery need to be discussed with the patients. When all these are undertaken, the patient is far more uh, understanding about the need for surgery and the importance of surgery and what the realistic expectation of the surgery. Encourage surgery actually when needed. The success rates are above 65% in most cases, going up to 90% with experienced surgeons, surgeons whether it's a trabeculectomy or a glaucoma a drainage device. And ultimately, long-term success is relatively good and most often a reduction in medications is useful. So the question is, is early surgery helpful as well? The CIGTS and Moorfield's primary treatment trial encouraged early surgery. The mean IOP in uh, primary treatment trial was 14.5 millimeter mercury in contrast to 18.5 for medication or laser group. And advanced glaucoma did better with early surgery in CIGTS trial. Surgically treated patients likely benefit from less diurnal IOP fluctuation, lower peak pressures, and a lower mean intraocular pressure. Therefore, uh, these need to be considered and weighed very, very carefully. The minim minimally invasive glaucoma surgery, though has higher safety, but lesser efficacy as compared to trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices. Higher safety could encourage us to operate earlier, even in mild to moderate glaucoma. This may possibly postpone conventional surgeries in some situations. Ultimately, to simplify it, there are four simple questions for decision making which we, should, we as surgeons should answer. Is the patient progressing or likely to progress at the current IOP? What is the rate of progression? How old is the patient and will he or she lose useful vision in his or her lifetime? And do the potential benefits of surgery outweigh the risks that we are taking? When we answer these simple questions, which actually the answers of which can be a tightrope walking, ultimately we should end up with some amount of a conformity between what the patient thinks and what the surgeon thinks, and we should arrive at a conclusion about which is the best method forward to take. Once we have that, we should be able to sec more successfully control glaucoma. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Well, thanks, Dr. Sirish. I think uh, Dr. Sirish has logged in now. 
Yeah, I am there, Dr. Vishwa. Sorry. Yes. Anyway, thanks. It was nice listening to you. If you want to add something, I don't see any uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, I am fine. Uh, okay. So uh, it was a very nice overview of uh, when to uh, do the surgery. So it's very important. It's not only important to learn the surgery, but it's also important to make decision. And that's the most crucial uh, thing that uh, you emphasized. So uh, that was a very interesting talk. I don't think there are any questions in the chat box. Uh, but uh, what I would uh, like to ask you is that uh, at times when you are inclined towards surgery and if the patient is not too keen on surgery, how do you handle these situations? Uh, yeah, those definitely are tough situations because we know that, you know, it's a dead end. Uh, see, when we are inclined towards surgery, obviously it means that, you know, we are convinced that, you know, there is going to be progression if you don't hop it. It's a clear-cut situation. I'm sure we will be advising surgery only during such situations. And in situations like this, when the patient don't agree, it's all desperate attempts like SLT, you know, uh, maximum medication we try. Now we have option of... Uh, uh, all the uh, methoxodil and all that, you know, if you want to add up, add them up also. So the fifth medication option has become available recently. Uh, so not very happy situations to keep putting five medications into the patient's eye and SLT. But uh, I think the the more important than our medical decisions of adding medications and doing uh, laser therapies, I think a cr crucial thing would be to. Uh, make the patient understand, you know, what he, what we are heading into, what he's going to face in future, what is the amount of uh, sight years that he's going to have in front of him. And I, probably given the situation nowadays, medical legally, I think also it becomes important that we record the conversation. I think so. Okay. <laughs> True that. I think I agree. And uh, in glaucoma, I would always say that uh, counseling, counseling and counseling is the key. You have to keep counseling the patient, keep explaining them about the disease, how much of a time is, it requires. And that plays a very, very important role because it's hard for them to understand uh, the kind of disease because they tend to correlate it or simulate it with the cataract and stuff. So that becomes a very uh, big challenge when we take decisions like that. Uh, okay, thanks, Dr. Sirish. I think we'll proceed to the next talk that is by Dr. Krishna Prasad. Um, he's yet to yeah, log in. Thank you so think... much, Dr. Krishna. Yeah. Thank you. So, do we have his video, uh, Shashan? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'll play it now. Yeah. So, let me at the outset thank uh, the KOS as well as Dr. Ilan Kumar for the opportunity. So, I'll be talking about the tubes in glaucoma surgery. The, the new thing that we do for our recalcitrant cases. Left failure as in a trabeculectomy is the biggest pain and the subconjunctival fibrosis is the major culprit and obviously it is the nature against which we are working. The nature always tends to close the fistula so that most of the trabeculectomy logically should fail by the closure. So the solution obviously has to be a conduit which doesn't close. So obviously your subconjunctal fibrosis should not be altering the filtration, should be a non-issue. And the drainage of this aqueous has to go to a, a different reservoir because it cannot be obviously in the subconjunctal space beyond, well beyond it is a remote reservoir into which this aqueous should drain so that that can actually work like. So on this basis, a lot of valves, shunts and setons have been uh, developed. We have basically two various, uh, uh, no, two different types, the non-valve one. The, the top in the list in India is the Audi or the, I mean, Arvin aqueous drainage implant, the Molteno, Burwell, Shocket, and Eistend. Whereas, world implants are the most important. The center stage is the Amad glaucoma valve. We have the Krupin. So, the basic difference is the valve ones have a valve in their foot plate, control the filtration and open for a particular pressure and does not cause hypotony. And non valve one basically work on the resistance created by the fibrosis around the foot plate. So obviously it cannot start working from day one. You need to strangulate the tube for some time with the absorbable suture till the fibrosis sets in. And that's how the non valve implants take a little longer to start working normally around four to six weeks. So the general principle is to have a tube on a plate. 
the tube size is around uh, 300 microns usually and the uh, pressure control obviously is uh, immediate from valve implants and in non valve implants you need to wait for the suture to dissolve and also for the fibrosis to set in so that there will be no hypotony. So the molten was the earliest like in 70s it came with a single thin plate of 30 millimeters and a silicon tube and we had the various modifications later a double plate molten and the pressure ridge all that and obviously molten is not a very preferred one now it is no more uh, being used much the bore welds came uh, with a lot of promise it has a large you know flange it goes into the uh, underneath the rectile muscles and these uh, has got a silicon tube obviously it's a non valve implant uh, which is placed under the rectile insertion so obviously this the foot plate uh, the flanges go beneath the rectile muscles and this is how it works and the um, arvind uh, i mean aqueous drainage implant or is basically a prototype of bare welds and it's a larger surface area it's quite flexible it's very easy to insert and is quite aff I mean, affordable for most of the indian patients so it's again a non valved device. Obviously, you need to do a vicryl to blocking for some time. It dissolves in six weeks, and you need to continue the AGMs for at least six weeks till that effect comes in. Ahmed glaucoma valve is the thing which changed the way we operate our recalcitrant cases, pediatric cases, secondary glaucomas, or neovascular glaucomas. There are two varieties: the larger foot plate and the smaller foot plate. The FP7 is. Uh, for the normal patients, adult patients, and for pediatric and small globes, we can use a FP8 model, which has got a, almost half the surface area. So it's a valve implant, very efficient. Hypotenuse are very uncommon. Immediately starts from day one itself. Efficient, very consistent. The opening pressure of 12 millimeters of mercury. And so you can also increase the filtration by adding the add-ons like biplate design. And you can even put it in the pass planar clip. So I would like to show you a, a one minute video of uh, how we do an amet glaucoma implant, which is not uh, very difficult. The learning curve is not very steep. You can use a patch to cover the tube, the first five millimeters of the tube, or you can even use in a healthy sclera, you can use the uh, partial thickness scleral flap to do this. So you have, so that the, uh, the first five millimeter of the tube is under the sclera, then you can Put the AGV after priming the uh, channels. You can put it between the rectile muscles and hitch the uh, AGV foot plate to the sclera. Then the tube is of the size of the 23 gauge needle. So you can create a fistula under the right thing, uh, under the flap into the anterior chamber angle so that the same needle track can be used to pass the tube into the anterior chamber. This tube has to be put precisely between the uh, anterior chamber angle between the endothelium and the iris so they don't touch each other you can cover the uh, thing and close the conjunctiva so here the subcranial fibrosis is of non-issue and these patients do really well uh, from day one so i stent is the new fat usually more in the western countries a very smallest implant here it bypasses the trabecular measure the snorkel projects into the anterior chamber and this can be implanted into or injected into this trabecular measure using a surgical gonioscope the expression made some news in the past. Uh, it, it was a, a, a device which was designed as an adjuvant to trabecular clip. It was not basically draining by itself. Like it's a metal device would replace a trab ostium. There was no need to manually do an ostium. There was no need for an iridectomy. And obviously this downside was very expensive and the fibrosis of a trab failures would continue irrespective of the tube. You can see the tube which is projecting in the anterior chamber angle. So just a small, uh, a video of it's like any other trabeculectomy uh, you can uh, do a flap and here i am injecting the uh, expression using the injector and once it pierces the thing you can just inject it it gets uh, locked between the two it neither comes out nor goes in further and this tube basically acts like an ostium this uh, tube like an ostium so there is no need to actually do an iridectomy and you can close the trap like any other uh, trap closure. So that is the whole idea. So the expression obviously is a uh, thing which did not work because it carried all the problems of a uh, trabeculectomy. Hydrus microstent is a new thing where you, you basically cannulate the uh, and hold or like a scaffold, you hold the uh, Schlems canal with an eight millimeter long device, which is done through again a surgical gonioscope. Now we have drainages into a different altogether area like a supracordial space, a cypass, which is a 
a supracoral drainage device which again projects into the anterior chamber and uh, the sole implant is basically again a supracoral space uh, drainage device where it's made out of a 24 uh, carat gold device with two plates and this basically uh, helps to drain the fluid into the subconjunct into the supracoral space again a conjunctival non uh, independent surgery so zen implant is again a new thing which is a six millimeter long collagen device with a gelatin cylinder which uh, can drain the aqueous out so we have various uh, toys around which can actually replace a routine trabeculectomy whereas the amet glaucoma implant has been a, a valve has been uh, the main uh, force or the main uh, uh, option that we have in most cases so tubes and shunts the change is imminent obviously trabeculectomy can't be the answer in most cases the fibrosis becomes a non issue takes away the major equation major problem in the equation and it has to be a conjunctival independent surgery whereas the cost of these implants would be a new problem and the market pressures to use a particular implant has to be not taken care into consideration i think with uh, uh, more ideas uh, i mean with uh, with the more market uh, being full of uh, option that we have we will be able to get the pressure to a target level uh, despite the you know failures of traffic like thank you very much And thanks, uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad, for a wonderful talk. I think he's unable to log in, but uh, we could get the insight of uh, different types of glaucoma shunts that can be used uh, in addition to the glaucoma surgeries. I think in this uh, session, we have almost covered all types of surgeries, whether it is trabeculectomy or combined surgery, uh, glaucoma shunt and mix, even pediatric glaucoma. So, and also we learned that how and when to do surgery. So, uh, I think it was a complete uh, package in itself. Uh, we don't have any questions from audience. So, I would like to just uh, talk about each uh, talks that we, we've had. So, I think Dr. Amit Kodwal had uh, presented about cataract and trabeculectomy uh, and the bleb issues. Well, uh, trabeculectomy is uh, still the most popular surgery, I would say, and most commonly done surgery uh, by glaucoma specialists all over the world. And that is how we need to understand that uh, how to use it, when to use it, and how to combine it with cataract surgery and how to manage post-operatively. A little part that we did not cover much about is the post-operative care, which is again very important in trabeculectomy that when you use uh, mitomycin C or when you use releasable sutures or you still see congestion, what happens? How do you manage the bleb in a situation where uh, you're still seeing pressures high or hypotonies and other um, gamut all to together that needs to be understood before we take up these surgeries for patients. And of course, it is very important to understand which patients uh, are entitled to which surgeries. So as I said, most of the situations we can do trabeculectomy, but uh, there are certain situations where trabeculectomy's outcomes may not be as great um, at, or we do not expect it to be as great. So that is where the role of other surgeries come up, particularly glaucoma shunts, again, are very time-tested uh, surgeries where we would uh, uh, advise for patients who have failed trabeculectomies are there or patients with the very refractive glaucoma like uh, NVG or uh, post-retina surgeries. Uh, post PKP, those situations where we can primarily resort, resort to shunts as well. Now, Dr. Sirish, if you're around. Okay. So um, uh, that is uh, something that we need to keep in mind. Now, where does the role of uh, leb free surgeries or mix or um, that Dr. Swati talk, talked about comes? Well, um, these angle surgeries are getting more and more popular now because we do understand that there are blood related issues and it is not that only we are talking about severe or advanced stage glaucomas. There are many early and uh, moderate glaucomas that we keep uh, operating or we have to uh, do surgical management. So in those situations and when you can access the angle with a gonioscope, it is uh, very uh, useful to use these devices or do goniotomies, even the Kahu delayed goniotomy as uh, Dr. Swati showed, but yes, of course it is a expensive stuff, but using it with a needle and also using a proline suture to do those um, 
canaloplasty kind of a thing or removing the inner wall of the Schlem's canal by using the protein suture is again a very promising thing which you can uh, try in patients where especially cataract surgery is being done along if you don't want a bleb uh, related surgery. However, whatever said and done, moderately advanced disease or severe disease, these uh, uh, mix may not be very useful because you cannot reduce the pressure uh, significantly low. So, for example, in a severe disease, if you need a pressure of say under 10 or uh, in single digits, that is what cannot be achieved by these devices. So, if you want to achieve a pressure say around 14 to 18 or 14 to 20, something like that, those are the situations where these surgeries can be useful. Also, uh, in uh, pediatric glaucoma, guniotomy is uh, taking more and more place now, even in India. Earlier, we had very limited usage of goniotomy because most of the time we uh, used to deal with advanced disease and where the cornea is not clear and cornea is uh, so that the access to angle is not as good. So we directly resort to trabeculectomy and trabeculotomy. But as more and more we are seeing early cases or cases with clear cornea, goniotomy is an option because you are not touching the conjunctiva or it is not dependent on bleb and you always have TRAB and TRAB as a second option. So that is something that can be tried in patients with, uh, in children with clear cornea. So goniotomy is something that is uh, uh, need of the R for early glaucoma cases, early pediatric glaucoma cases. Uh, secondly, now talking about GAT, uh, that is the proline suture, that is something, as I said, in adults uh, with the cataract surgery, something that can be used, okay? And talking about the last talk, that is uh, glaucoma shunts that uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad took. Well, uh, AGV is the most uh, favorable, or I would say the most accepted uh, shunt that uh, we've been using because it has a valve that controls the pressure. So you're not too worried about hypotenuse, the bowel and uh, its counterpart, Indian counterpart, Adi, I would say is something that is again, very popularly used because that is cost effective. But what we need to keep in mind is that does not have a uh, valve. So you need to um, use the suture uh, to uh, sort of titrate or initially uh, prevent hypotony. And you have to be very careful in post-operative follow-up when the suture release is being done. So uh, that is something which is a very important part of glaucoma shunt surgery. As I said, post-trab, how you handle the post-operative care, uh, that depends on the, uh, that, uh, you know, sort of determines your outcome of the surgery. Similarly, in glaucoma shunt, it is very important to uh, understand how you follow it post-operatively so that your outcomes are uh, op optimum and the patient can get maximum benefit of the surgery. So when you have uh, bowel or Adi, you also have to manage the uh, suture release that happens. So initially you put a suture so that the flow is not the maximum and as the suture gets released, the pressure tends to go down. Sometimes you can get hypotony when the pressure, uh, the suture suddenly releases. So those are the situations that we need to understand how to handle. I think so we have covered uh, most of the talks and uh, uh, discussion. If we do not have any questions, I think uh, we can close the session, uh, giving time to the, for the next session. Can we conclude Dr. Ilai? Right. So uh, thank you everyone. I thank all the speakers um, for the wonderful presentations and also all the attendees who have been listening to us. Thank you very much. Shashank, I think we can close the session. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thank you.